I met someone this week who said they were taking the family to SeaWorld. SeaWorld? Really? Years after the documentary Blackfish, and you still want to take the kids to SeaWorld? So, for the long holiday, if you really want to understand the orcas, see them as part of a slave trade that is kept alive by SeaWorld. And don't go to SeaWorld. Instead, honor the orcas by reading Captain Paul Watson's Orcopedia. That's coming up, and also a new feature at the end of the segment. My A Meal in a Minute Vegan Tip. Something to help you on your vegan journey. All that on this edition of the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, Captain Paul Watson, an original founder of Greenpeace who left it to start Sea Shepherd, famed for its courageous direct actions on behalf of animals. After 50 years on the sea, he now writes books to provoke the public and motivate activists to do more. His new book, Orcopedia, is a register of all the orcas in captivity, and it serves as a rallying call to stop what Watson unabashedly calls a slave trade. PETA actively works to end the suffering of imprisoned orcas from its campaign to end SeaWorld's cruelty to its groundbreaking lawsuit that alleges SeaWorld violates the 13th Amendment, the constitutional prohibition of slavery. In my conversation with Captain Watson, he talks about the orcas held captive in the U.S. and around the world, including Lolita, who has been at the Miami Seaquarium for 50 years. PETA is suing the Seaquarium to force them to allow Lolita to be moved to a seaside sanctuary in her home waters. And we also talk about the moment that changed his life and why he's dedicated to the animals. But first, the book Orcopedia, written with co-author Tiffany Humphrey. It shows all the orcas held captive around the world, as well as those who've died. It's a document of those orcas caught in a slave trade that will make any person think twice before visiting SeaWorld. Here's my conversation of Sea Shepherd's famed Captain Paul Watson about his new book, Orcopedia, on the PETA Podcast. What strikes me about this book is is the framework. Everyone knows Wikipedia. If you have a Wikipedia page, you're fortunate. You've done something. To put the orcas into that context that people know, Orcopedia, I think is communicates, you know, what you want to communicate instantly. It's everything you always wanted to know about these specific orcas. And the framework, I think, is uh, the achievement of the book. Thank you. Yeah, I don't think that a lot of people are aware of just how many orcas have been captured and how many have died in captivity and how many are presently in captivity and that it's a it's right around the the planet uh, they're, they're all over uh so uh you know people are aware of say the orca and sea world in you know san diego or the orca and say in, in in florida but they don't really see the big picture of where all of these uh, uh you know captive um wonderful animals are being kept and it is a slave trade. It's exactly what it is. It's uh, these are highly intelligent, uh, sentient, self-aware beings that we're just bartering and selling uh, for for profit and for amusement. Yeah, you say that, and that was going to be my next question. That you know, people tend to forget because they they'll see the orcas at Sea World and they say, okay, yeah, we're against Sea World, but you put it into context here with this orcopedia, all the information and. The thing that strikes me is that you write how it constitutes this slave trade. And I think that's something that, again, people don't necessarily take the leap and understand that this is what's happening to these, these free, you know, wild, you know, these animals in the wild. Now they're, they're essentially in this format, not of their choosing. So just Talk a little bit more about the analogy to slate. It's more than just an analogy. It's the reality for these animals. 
we're, we're pulling um, these uh, wonderful creatures from, from their, their families uh, in various places, the ocean, off Iceland, off of British Columbia, whatever. Uh, it's very traumatizing uh, to them. We pull them away from their mothers. Um, and then we put them into a situation with the with other orcas, which are not even related to them. And in fact, they have different languages, which not many people are aware of. That uh, an orca in British Columbian waters has a completely different dialect than a, an orca in Icelandic waters. So they're almost like aliens together there. And uh, in many cases, they're um, that causes a lot of uh, conflict. And that so it's um, we don't really think too much about how they think, how they feel, uh, what, you know, just what they're suffering. We People just don't think about that, that at all. One of the things I find most fascinating is that there's not been a single recorded case of an orca in the wild attacking and killing a human being. It's never happened. Mm. But three people have been killed by orcas in captivity. And people say, well, why do they do that? And I said, well, just to picture yourself walking through the exercise yard of, an, of a maximum security prison full of serial killers. <laughs> you know? uh, there's some people with some deep psychological problems. You're, that's a risky endeavor. The, many of these orcas are, are seriously uh, mentally disturbed because of the confinement and because of uh, the way they've been treated. And you, you, they're not normal. And just interrelating with them is a risky endeavor for the people who are involved on that. They're unpredictable in that sense. And, and so when they're unpredictable, is that because of the, where the context in which they're placed, this enslaved yeah. sense, is that what creates this uh, instability in them? Incredible frustration of uh, being cooped up in those cells. It's like being in isolation or just with a couple of prisoners in a cell for the rest of your, of your life. And, uh, you know, no longer being able to rim, to swim freely in the ocean, no longer to be amongst your family. And uh, it's it's incredibly alien environment that they've been put into. And uh, there's a lot of trauma, a lot of trauma that's in, involved in that. The, uh, you know, I, I've swum with orcas in the wild and uh, it was an amazing experience. Uh, it was way back uh, in, in the or 70s, but uh, we were in a, a boat in the Bella Bella Straits in British Columbia and uh, saw a pot of orcas coming towards us. These are transient orchids. And uh, we, uh, three of us jumped in the water right in front of them. Now, I can tell you, seeing orcas from the deck of a boat and seeing orcas when just your head's sticking out of the water is two completely different perspectives. <laughs> Suddenly, the first thought that comes to me is, yeah. these guys eat sea lions, and yeah. they're bigger than we are. <laughs> So they, and then suddenly the whole pod disappeared. Now, the only thing more uh, stressful than a pod of oncoming orcas was a pod of orcas that suddenly disappeared. Now you don't know where they are. And they surfaced right beside us, so close. I reached out and grabbed, I don't know why I did this. I reached out and grabbed the dorsal of the one that passed me. And he pulled me through the water for 100 meters or so, and then just flipped me off and I was tumbling <laughs> in his wake. You don't go up to a lion in the Serengeti and pet it. <laughs> But here, the most formidable predator on the planet allowed me to do that. Now, I don't think it's because they like us. I think it's, they, I think it's because they understand us, that they know what we're capable of. Way back in 1910, some orcas broke the ice under uh, some of Captain Scott's party in Antarctica. And they broke the ice. But when they realized that they weren't penguins, they left. They could have taken them, but they didn't. Again, they're able to distinguish, uh, to to uh, determine what is, uh, you know, what they take, because I think they're extremely intelligent. You know, the the average, the human brain, it's a 1700 cu cubic centimeter organ. The orca has a 6,000 cubic centimeter brain, the sperm whale brain's a 9,000 cubic centimeter oh, brain, yeah. and the convolutions on the neocortex area, of both the sperm whale and the orca are far more pronounced than they are on, on the primate brain. And also, Mice to men, we, we have three lobes to the brain, but cetaceans have four lobes. And that fourth lobe is almost all associative behavior. Their ability to communicate is way off the charts of anything that we understand. They know what they're doing. It's no mistake with the way the, when the orcas confront, it wasn't a confrontation, but when they engaged with you, they knew what they were doing. They're, they're dangerous to predators or to their uh, their enemies, but to someone like yourself, they could be indifferent, be nice, and then go on, right? I mean, 
I think it's because they choose to live in a uh, state of peaceful coexistence with us. Yeah. That's what they want yeah. uh, because they know what we can do. I mean, we exterminated uh, pods of orcas off Iceland, shot them down with machine guns uh, back in the 60s. Uh, they were regularly shot at by fishermen for many, many, many years. When I was in the Canadian Coast Guard in uh, the late in 1969, uh, I had a captain on my who said, we saw a pot of orcas off of British Columbia. And he says, got to watch for those. I've seen those guys eat people like you wouldn't believe. They're the most ferocious uh, monsters on the planet. Well, he never saw anybody get eaten by an orca, but it was just some myth that he's relating and, you know, they, and they embellished and everything else like that. But people were really afraid of them. And uh, so I can tell you in 1975, when I went into the water with the orcas, it was uh, after hearing stories about how they were such monsters. So we were really confronting that uh, fear when, um, when we did that. And we, di and we discovered something amazing, that uh, they are not the monsters that people perceived them to be. The killer whales are only killers when they have to. Is that it? Out of self-defense, maybe? Yeah, well, that you know, they're predators. There's no doubt about that, and that's. But uh, but also, they they distinguish. There's some orcas in British Columbia that only eat fish, and some that only eat marine mammals. The residents, uh, orcas, eat fish. The transients eat marine mammals. Uh, so they're not the same, and they don't actually. They they sometimes intermingle, but they don't really work together. So they're like two different tribes of orcas in that. <laughs> Uh, but we've seen them in all, we've seen them in Antarctica, in the North Atlantic, the South Pacific. I mean, orcas uh, are everywhere. They're not as, they're not a lot of them, but they're there and you, and, and you see them. So let's get back to this point about enslavement, because that's a powerful word. And when you mention it, there'll be some pushback to say, how can you say, you can't really say they're enslaved well, they by every definition of slavery, they certainly they're captured and and taken from their uh, their group, their their pod. Uh, they're separated from their their mother, uh, and from their brothers and sisters. They're pulled away from that. They're taken to an alien environment and forced to serve their masters. And the masters are the aquarium facilities that uh, basically force them to do uh, tricks and to entertain people. So I, it, it, to me, that's the very definition of slavery, being controlled by your masters to make, to do things to make a profit for your masters. Yeah. And, and especially when you're dealing with highly intelligent creatures. I, I personally believe that, uh, that orcas are more intelligent than we are. But um, well, of course, a lot of people push back on that and say, I had a whaler in Norway one time. He says, Watson, you say whales are more intelligent than we are. How can you say such a stupid thing? And I said, well, you know, George, I measure intelligence by the ability to live in harmony with your natural environment. And by that criteria, orcas are far more intelligent than we are. And he looked at me and said, well, by that criteria, cockroaches are more intelligent than we are. I said, George, you're beginning to understand what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah. uh, we measure intelligence by hand-to-eye coordination, the ability to make tools. You know, if a blob of protoplasm stepped out of a spaceship tomorrow, yeah. we'd automatically assume it's intelligent. Because it has technology, but it's a blob of protoplasm. You know? yeah. <laughs> but so to, to us, intelligence is a tool. Intelligence is a gun. That's what we define intelligence by. But if a dog were to walk into the room, it could tell you who was there yesterday if it was able to tell you, but uh, it knows. Yeah. <laughs> so, so these highly intelligent beings enslaved, as you see it. And, you know, PETA has uh, been, our listeners to our podcast know that we've talked about the lawsuit that, that PETA filed uh, saying that using the orcas as slaves were in violation of the 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. What kind of lives should orcas be living? Born free, they should live free? If, if they weren't in small, chlorinated concrete tanks, what would the ideal life be? Well, the ideal life is to be free in their uh, natural environment uh, to do what orcas do. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that some orcas have been born to captivity. What do we do with them? Because they don't know anything else. And that's where this idea of sea pens came in, is to have large areas, say, like a cut off a fjord or a bay and and put, reintroduce the orcas into that so that they can learn how to survive within that uh, small ecosystem. And before they can be released, but we know they can be released, um, you know, because uh, that that was successfully happened, uh, you know, with the whole free willy thing and everything. And that Keiko was uh, was released and survived in the well. Uh, he died of tuberculosis, but he 
got that tuberculosis in captivity. Yeah. Not in the wild. So it wasn't anything in the wild that killed him. But see, the the aquarium peoples are there going, well, see, you, we released him and he died. Yeah, a year later of a disease which he contracted while he was in captivity. That certainly is an indication that they can't fend for themselves. See, this is one of the, the great things about your, your new book, Orcopedia, a guide to the victims of the international orca slave trade that you co-wrote with uh, Tiffany Havenfrey. I'm, I'm looking at uh, Makayo. And I guess I'm attracted to Makayo because we have the same birth date. And then I'm looking at Makayo and I see that he's at uh, SeaWorld and uh, he was born in captivity, Makayo. And uh, seventh calf, I mean, you go into the whole background. First, uh, it says Makayo is Katina's seventh calf. Katina's first calf, Kalina, passed away on October 4th, 2010 only five days before Makaya was born. And it says that, uh, it, is there hope for Makayo to get out? I mean, he was hurt in 2014. You get a whole history of these uh, orcas. And it it's just fascinating because I now that I know that I share a birthday with Makayo, I, I care for this Makayo who's in Orlando at SeaWorld. That's what we're hoping the book will do is have people identify uh, but that these are really uh, feeling, intelligent, uh, self-aware, sentient beings. Well, what's the hope for Mikayo? Sea pens? Can he get out? I think that the sea pen is a transition to captivity. And what we do, you know, for instance, we know what the dialects are. John Ford's uh, uh, work with uh, studying orca dialects has demonstrated we can tell from an orca in captivity where it came from, whether it came from Iceland, whether it came from uh, the West Pacific Northwest. And therefore, we should look at reintroducing them into the area where they were originally came from so that they can be reconnected with their with their pods. Orcas have incredible memories. I'm sure that uh, they would be able to, uh, you know, bring any of these uh, any of these uh, individuals back into the pod if given the opportunity to do that. It wouldn't be difficult to take some uh, an orca that's been in, say, uh, you know, Orlando, and bring it back to the Pacific Northwest. No. Well, that would be the the the, the thing to do. Yes, is if it's from the Pacific Northwest, we set up a sea pen in the Pacific Northwest for maybe a year or two, and also put that sea pen in a position where it's in the pathway of of, of orca pods. So therefore, the orca within the sea pen can hear the orcas on the outside and see how they respond. And that, and the, and the ones on the outside can hear the one that's in the sea pen. And that would be the first step to reintroduction to uh, the pods. So, all right. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I mentioned, uh, Mikhail, he happens to be in captivity. I'm concerned about him. Your book, uh, list starts out with the famous ones and, and, you know, Keiko, of course, people know, uh, Til- Tilikum, uh, people know they're they're all featured here, but I'm particularly moved by Lolita, who was stolen from her family in 1970 off the coast of Washington and has been held um, in a 35 by 80 foot tank for 50 years. And not only has she been held for 50 years, but she's being held alone. With uh, and these are highly social animals. That it's, uh, it's a it's, it's a form of cruelty, and uh, I believe that. People have offered a lot of money to have uh, Lolita release, but you know they've refused. Yeah. So it's uh, it is frustrating in, in that respect. Yeah. I would like to see legislation that would shut these things down. We're seeing this in Canada. Canada actually passed legislation to shut it down, and hopefully that will extend uh, to other other countries. We're suing uh, marine land in um, in southern France uh, and trying to get it shut down because. Um, a few years ago, they had a flood there, which, uh, you know, had a had a lethal impact on a lot of the residents and uh, because they didn't prop- take the proper measures. So we're suing them on the grounds that they're negligent and incompetent. And hopefully um, we'll find a way to um, to release those orcas. So I, I mentioned Lolita. I also mentioned Mikayo. Just from flipping the book, I found Mikayo. I'm now bonded with Mikayo. You've dealt with orcas for much of your life. Tell me about the ones you've been able to meet and which which orcas have particularly moved you. 
I have met uh, Tilikum when uh, Tilikum was uh, captive in uh, Victoria, British Columbia. I spent a lot of time with Ascana, who is really one of the first settlers ever put into captivity at the Vancouver Aquarium. And uh, at one point, uh, Dr. Paul Spong was studying. Uh, he was hired by the Vancouver Aquarium to study uh, Scanna and suddenly realized that Scanna was studying him. <laughs> and uh, he became quite um, radicalized about this whole thing and said, you know, th th this orchid does not belong here. And of course, he was fired by the Vancouver Aquarium for doing that. But while he was there, he took people like Bob Hunter and myself into meet Scanna. And uh, I remember one point Bob Hunter put his face down and Scanna came up with her mouth wide open and took his Bob's entire head in her mouth. Then her teeth touched the sides of his head just gently mm. and uh, then pulled back. And as uh, and what uh, Bob's uh, what Paul Spong said to Bob Hunter was that's her showing that she trusts you mm. and uh, also as seen if you trust her. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so I've had that experience in the wild with uh, an unnamed orchid because they don't have names yeah. but, uh, <laughs> of actually having my hand go over the teeth and onto the tongue, hmm. you know, which could lo literally lose your hand, but the orchid didn't, didn't take my hand. Uh, so th this, I don't know of any other animal really that you can quite have that kind of experience with. T tell me when you experience that with an orca in the wild, and then I I imagine you have encountered or met some in captivity, or and are they different? Yeah. Are they different in when oh, yeah. you see them in captivity? And then do they would they respond in the same way that the the wild orca would? Where the wild orca is actually gentler and would, oh, no, I think that the ones in captivity were gentler because there was closer. Things, that, but but it wasn't a question of the one in the wild being not gentle. I think the best way to describe the difference is that the one in the wild was the attitude was sort of like oh nothing nothing here really this is just uh, amusing yeah. <laughs> you just, know, just a human uh, <laughs> you know they, they, it's like uh, he didn't have to be there yeah he's <laughs> always perfectly free to do it uh, with Scanna and those uh, they there was no there was no um, nowhere there for them to go they had to and you know when people say well they do these tricks willingly i think no first of all they do it for one reason for food second for because they're bored they're easily bored and so they do a lot of these things to, to get around that around that boredom but uh the the training is not gentle you know yeah. there, there's a lot of uh, deprivation of food deprivation uh that goes into that process so they are punished on that I think one of the most disgusting things that they do is uh, they literally masturbate the, the males to get the semen for, uh, you know, for reproductive purposes uh, to in the aquarium or the marine uh, captivity trade. Right. So and that actually is something that was done also during the days of slavery, uh, days of human slavery, where you had breeding programs that uh, were designed in order to produce a, a stronger uh, worker, you yeah. know, in the plantation. So again, that shares that, uh, that characteristic with slavery. Well, it's funny. Uh, when I talked to John Hargrove, he talked about that act in order to save the sperm. And he talked about how the sperm is really what is used to, to spread out worldwide this slave trade, because now you can breed them, you can breed them all over the world. And, I, I love your book because it shows all the pictures and headstones of the, the deceased and the pictures of the living. But the picture that got me the most was the map of the world to show where all these places are that have the, you know, where the orcas are held captive. You have a, a place in Russia, Japan, uh, China, they're in France and Spain. How do we stop this? I mean, I guess we have to, can we control the, the the sperm or the reproductive uh, uh, means the, to 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 breed or how do we how do we stop this uh, from going on in that way? Well, now that we have Canada and India places that have uh, are actually having legislation to stop uh, this captivity, hopefully that, that we can get that uh, the United Nations involved to have international regulations, uh, you know, to shut it down on the grounds that it's um, immoral. 
and uh, that it's also um, it's destructive uh, ecologically. We're actually taking these animals out of their ecosystems. But also the lifespan of an orca is pretty much similar to the lifespan of a human being. And uh, but once in captivity, their their average lifespan is much lower. Lolita is actually an exception to the rule. She's been there for 50 years. But uh, if the ones that born in captivity is very high mortality on the on the newborns. But uh, I if they get to past 30, they're doing pretty good. But uh, it's, it's, it's not a healthy system for them. And uh, it kills them. Over 200 of them have died in, in captivity way before their time. Yeah. The, uh, the headstones in the book are really, you know, they're very emotional to see them. And uh, some of them have names. Many of them have names, but the, a lot of them have no names. There's a lot of unnamed orcas that, that you also uh, um, have a, a headstone for. Uh, what, what, what is it like when you go through the headstones and see all the orcas who have died in captivity? Well, I certainly, the one, I remember the ones that I knew that had died on that. I remember Scanna when she died. Uh, uh, what they wanted to do there uh, was so uh, disrespectful. Uh, the, the first uh, thought was, well, let's just sell her to a dog food company. <laughs> you know, yeah. and make dog food out of her. And of course, a lot of public protest against that. And uh, they ended up uh, burying her at sea. But, um, the, the, you know, to, because to the, to the captivity industry, they're just a commodity. That's all they are. They're just commodities. Uh, they don't really give much thought to the fact that these are sentient, thinking, emotional, feeling beings. They just don't. Detail the complicity of SeaWorld in this orca slave trade. If SeaWorld was not a part of this, would it still exist? Would it be minor? Would it be small? Or be, because SeaWorld is such a corporate entity uh, with not necessarily unlimited funds, but they have, uh, you know, a, a large amount of funds that they, you know, they, they protect for their shareholders, but they insist that this is their trade. So detail the complicity here of, of SeaWorld in well, keeping this going. SeaWorld demonstrated that huge profits can be made from this. And of course that was picked up by, you know, other, in other countries and that. And uh, it's a very uh, profit intensive industry uh, to the point where one orca can be worth millions of dollars on, on that. And the, and, this, and the sale of the sperm from the orcas can be worth uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's uh, SeaWorld, I think, has contributed greatly to the success of the industry over, overall, globally. But also, who, who, who else are complicit? All of us who actually pay, buy the tickets mm. and sit there and watch this without really giving much thought to, uh, to what, you know, the suffering of the, of the creatures that we're wat- watching. And, uh, you know, I think all of us uh, at some point were guilty of, of, of doing that. And... Uh, we didn't think too much of it at the time. I say, you know, occasionally younger people uh, will respond and say, well, there's, they think that there's something wrong with it, but they really can't put their finger on it and that. But and it's, it's like the whole concept of zoos, really. Are, it's just disrespectful and demeaning. You know, not people many realize that uh, the comparison back in the 20s, they used to go into, say, mountain gorilla colonies, kill all the adults. And just take the, the babies off to the zoos. And they do this with a lot of animals, kill off the adults and take the babies off to the zoos. Well, this is what they were doing with orcas for a long time. It's certainly what they're doing with dolphins right now mm-hmm. in Taiji, Japan, for example. We'll kill everything and just take the, the select ones for the aquarium trade uh, that they're doing. And so the comparisons are really there. Well, I'm sorry, Paul, but what do they accomplish by doing that, by killing every? All the others. Uh, I don't know. I never really understood the logic uh, behind it. I know in Taiji, what they do is they they go in, they they round up the dolphins. They say this one and this one is worth two hundred thousand dollars for the uh, for the marine aquarium trade. So we're going to keep those ones, kill the rest, and we'll sell the meat off to uh, you know to whatever who want dog food or whatever anybody wants it for. So it's just a it, the, the Taiji the Taiji dolphin drive would not exist without the marine aquarium industry. There's not enough money in killing dolphins for the meat. The money is with the aquarium industry. And uh, so that's what carries it on. You know, a lot of people don't realize too, that back in the, in the twenties in Belgium, that 
they had people in zoos. You know, you know, people were taken out of the Congo and put in zoos on exhibits. And you actually have photographs of people going to the zoos and and trying to feed the little you know black children in the in the things. I mean, it's it's, it's amazing uh, that you know, what we've endured in this kind of sick trade. Yeah. Uh, and of course we're getting better and better. I mean, we don't do that anymore well, and, we don't, and we don't kill off mountain gorilla adults to get the babies anymore, yeah. but you know, it's still, it's still there. Paul, you know, when you mentioned the Congo, you know, in the twenties, well, uh, here in America, 1904, the world's fair, and it happens with people, colonized people. The Americans were going into the Philippines my forebears, my, my, my ancestry. Uh, and they brought Filipinos from, from Mindanao, from all the different provinces, brought them to the world's fair in 1904 and put them in human, essentially a human zoo. Yeah. 1904. It's, it's, a uh, it's, it was there to sell imperialism to the Americans. We must, yeah. we must save these people, right? They need our help. And it's a way well, they that, certainly killed a lot in the Philippines in the process. Oh yeah. In the 18, in the, you know, the, as a, you know, as a result of the Philippine American war, nearly uh, based on some accounts uh, up to a million people and not directly from the war, but from the famine and from the, all the things uh, are resulting. It just seems that, uh, you know, we just never learn. I mean, you, you, your example from the Congo, the, the gorillas, and now what we're doing to the orcas. It seems that the uh, empathetic way doesn't seem to be working very much. I think also the problem is with humans is that we have this, uh, I call it a collective form of mass psychosis called anthropocentrism. This idea that uh, we're better than everything else. We're dominant over everything else. That we're apart from everything else. And as long as we have that attitude, we're going to continue to you know, commit these atrocities. We have to uh, go back to what we originally were uh, many, many thousands of years ago of having a biocentric point of view, which a lot of indigenous people have today, which is uh, this understanding that we're part of everything and that we have to live in harmony with all other species and uh, that there, we're not better than them. In fact, in many cases, we're not as even as important as them. I mean, we couldn't live on this planet without worms, trees, bees, and fish, but they can certainly get along without us. So, <laughs> you know, in that respect, uh, they're more important ecologically than we are. You well, know, the, the harmony issue, back to what you were saying about the intelligence of the orcas, uh, living, living in harmony with their environment and with uh, co peacefully coexisting. Uh, you know, a lot of people know you from the television show and from your direct action. Are you still doing that? What kind of direct action do you continue to do today? Why was it important to do such a uh, direct action? Could what you want be accomplished, be done without it? Or was it just necessary at the time? Well, I was a founding uh, director for the Greenpeace Foundation, which is protesting. And I came to the understanding that protesting was too submissive. It was like, please, please don't kill the whales. And they do it anyway. And all we did was hang banners and take pictures. So I set Sea Shepherd up to intervene. And so that's what we do. We're an interventionist, uh, anti-poaching uh, organization. And the strategy that we develop is, I call it aggressive nonviolence. So we don't injure anybody. We In 42 years, we haven't. But we have saved, uh, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of animals and shut down hundreds and hundreds of illegal operations. Just this last week, we arrested uh, six uh, poaching vessels in the waters of Sierra Leone. Over the last year, 65 vessels that we've seized that were poaching in, in those waters. And, uh, you know, we're working in the Gulf of uh, Mexico right now in the Sea of Cortez uh, to protect the endangered Baquita. I have three vessels there. And if it wasn't for that, I'm pretty confident that the Baquita would now be extinct. So Sea Shepherd now is a global movement. With uh, We have uh, 12 ships out on the ocean. And uh, at any given time, about 250 volunteers from about 25 different nations. And uh, so that's, I think, the thing I'm most proud of is what started as an organization is now a global movement. And uh, it's no longer even in my control. I, uh, you know, I'm just part of that movement now. And I guess it, at, at first you went out there, but do you, you don't do that still, do you? Or? Well, I... I I do go, you know, consult with the ship. So the reason I can't go out there is not that I don't want to. 
it's because uh, Japan has put me on the Interpol red notice preventing me from traveling uh, because they charged me with conspiracy to trespass. Now, I'll tell you, the Interpol red notice is for serial killers, war criminals, and major drug traffickers. And I'm the only person in history to be put on that list for conspiracy to trespass. <laughs> and But that just really shows you the uh, power that Japan has uh, in that. So I can go to France and I can come back to the U.S., but I, I can't go to I'm, – I'm, I'm both a U.S. and a Canadian citizen, but I can't go into Canada because the Canadians will send me off to uh, Japan. And uh, I, and here's a interesting – conspiracy to trespass on a whaling ship. I didn't actually do it. I conspired to do it, apparently. <laughs> Do, do you do you miss not going out there, or you can go to some places, but not all? But what? Well, I, I, do, I do miss it, but I spend a lot of time writing right now. But you know, I've spent I spent fifty years on the on the sea, and um, so it's. But the great thing about it is, I got literally dozens and dozens of captains and officers and engineers and directors out there who are doing it right now. So you know, it's uh, that that to me is very satisfying. That. That in fact, we're getting more done now than we ever have done in our entire history. So the term you used again was aggressive, nonviolence. Aggressive nonviolence. Where where is the line? How aggressive? Because well, you, don't, uh, you don't cause injury. Well, because from the other perspective, they're seeing you come, uh, you know, in the confrontational mode, and they're, you know, what is their reaction to your aggressiveness? Well, the actually the the mythology actually works in our favor you know a lot of the people we oppose think that we're real terrorists and we kill people and uh that's fine if they want to think that that's just fine because when we show up they're scared and they run <laughs> you know but uh the reality is we don't we don't hurt anybody i you know i uh, about 12 years ago i was invited to give a lecture to the fbi in quantico and uh uh, after the lecture, one of the FBI agents said, well, you know, Sea Shepherds walk in a pretty fine line when it comes to the law. And I said, yes, but it doesn't matter how fine that line is if we don't actually cross the line and we don't cross that line. You know, we don't we operate within the boundaries of the law and within the boundaries of practicality. And our opposition are criminals. These are poachers. These are people who are doing illegal things. And they said, well, you know, you destroy property. Yes, we do. We confiscate uh, fishing gear and we, we've sunk ships and everything, all of which are engaged in illegal activity. And to me, that is aggressive nonviolence. If somebody's about to, a poacher's about to shoot an elephant and you walk up and sm smack the rifle out of his hand and break the rifle, that is an act of nonviolence. You're preventing the killing of a sentient being by the destruction of a non-sentient object. That is a definition of aggressive nonviolence. Uh, like I said, we don't hurt anybody, and that's uh, that's a record that we're very, very proud of, and we intend to keep it. During the years of this aggressive nonviolence, any top memory, any top, um, is there that kind of motivating memory that you have? Well, we've never backed down on, on any of those confrontations, and uh, and that reputation has helped us considerably because our opposition knows that we're not going to uh, to back down. And we realize what the risks are. You know, when people join uh, the crew, I ask them this question, are you willing to risk your life to protect a whale or a shark? And if they say no, they say, well, then we can't use you. And when people say that's really asking an awful lot for people to risk their life to protect a whale, I said, really, is it? We ask young people not only risk their life, but to kill people for the defense of oil whales, real estate, religion, and flags. I think it's a far more noble pursuit to risk your life to protect an endangered species or a threatened habitat. I guess you get the good people signed up for Sea Shepherd then, huh? We got a lot of people who I think we've had over 7,000 volunteers that have participated on that. But even more important, even more important is that I think that we instill in our volunteers this understanding, this idea that each and every one of us can change the world. We just have to harness our passion to courage and imagination and go forward and do it. And so many of my crew members uh, have got, done just that. In fact, uh, PETA was established originally by Alex Pacheco, who was one of my crew members uh, in 1979. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, so it, 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 it's funny because uh, here you talk about 79, here we are 2021. Are we close to seeing the time when we can all just retire and say we are in that perfect world now and we don't have to worry about the bad guys and the animals are fine? Well, that would certainly, that would certainly be nice. Uh, but, and, and, but I do tell people to not be uh, pessimistic and not to be deterred by the situation. 
Uh, when people say, yeah, but it's impossible to solve these problems. Well, the answer to an impossible problem is to find an impossible solution. And how do you do that? <laughs> Through passion, courage, and imagination. The very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa was unthinkable, therefore impossible. And yet the impossible became possible. And I think that holds true with pretty much all of these problems that we encounter. We can solve impossible problems. And where do you assess where we are now uh, from the, you know, from your, the beginnings of Greenpeace, Sea Shepherd, uh, you know, your, well, your work with the orcas, where, 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 where do you think we are now? Well, I remember uh, being a vegetarian in the late 70s when that was considered an extremely radical thing to do. And nobody even heard, knew what a vegan was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, to back then, if you said, oh, I'm a vegan, what's that mean? Uh, from the planet Vega or something? You know, yeah. <laughs> nobody had it. The, the vegetarian, then the vegan movement is the fastest growing movement on this planet. I mean, it's amazing how what has been uh, accomplished uh, and how it's uh, how it's evolved and just uh you know, 40 years. It's, yeah. it's incredible. And it's getting more and more and more uh, people are being recruited into this. And more importantly, they're being recruited by an understanding that this is what is right, not only right for respect for animals, but also right for the planet. And uh, so I think that we've made a lot of progress in that respect. I, I think you have. And in terms of the orcas, to get back to the book, Orcopedia. I, I really think I was just flipping through it, like I said, and going to try to find my orca. This is sort of like if you not that I'd go to SeaWorld, but if I were to go to SeaWorld and they would give me a program or let's say, say if some were to go to SeaWorld and they had a program, this would be the anti program. You would present this. to. <laughs> well, I do know they don't sell that book in SeaWorld. <laughs> <laughs> well, this would be the great anti program that you that a tourist could have and say, and if I were to read this before uh, going to SeaWorld, it would make me go to the rides and maybe have a vegetarian thing at the at the food stand, if they have that, and then leave. Yeah, I think a lot of the people who go to these marine uh, captivity facilities today and as spectators, and they really don't give it much thought, but they're really no different than the people who used to go to freak shows in the 19th century and without any concern or empathy for the for the people who were in those shows, you know, who were had de who were deformed or had problems and everything like that, uh, all they saw was entertainment. And uh, this is again is what most spectators see is just entertainment. They don't really give a, any thought or compassion to the to the uh, beings which are being exploited to provide that entertainment. Well, certainly your book is is given me uh, a lot more insight than I thought I had some, but then now I, I look at it, it's all in one thing, this book, Orcopedia, that you've co-written with uh, Tiffany Humphrey. Um, and I, I should I should point out that, you know, T Tiffany did most of the work on that, so <laughs> I deserve the credit on that. Well, all right. I, I, I didn't want to give her short shrift, certainly. And uh, but uh, b before I we we say say goodbye, I know that you must have a favorite story that encapsulates what you're about. There's one story that uh, you know really was a defining point in my life, which involved a whale, and that was in 1975 when uh, we came up with this idea to uh, protect the whales from the Soviet whaling fleet in the North Pacific, and. Uh, we were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time. So we came up with this idea that all we had to do is put ourselves between the harpoon and the whales and we'd save the whales. That was the idea. And so in June of 1975, Bob Hunter and I were in a small inflatable boat in front of a Soviet harpoon vessel that was bearing down on us at full speed. And in front of us were eight uh, sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And, uh, Every time the uh, harpooner tried to take a shot, I would block the path of the harpoon. And this worked for about 20 minutes until the <laughs> captain on the Soviet vessel came running down the catwalk and he screamed into the ear of the harpooner, then brought his finger across his neck like that and looked down on us and smiled. And that's when I realized Gandhi's not going to work for us today. <laughs> and a few moments later, there's this incredible explosion and the harpoon flew over our heads and slammed into the backside of a female in the pod and it exploded. And she screamed. I didn't even even occurred to me that a whale would scream and she rolled on her side in a fountain of blood and suddenly the largest whale in that pod slammed the water with his tail and dove and he swam right underneath of us threw himself out of the water straight at the bow of the soviet vessel 
but they were ready for him with an unattached harpoon, pulled the trigger, hit him point blank range in the head. He screamed back, rolling in agony on the surface. And as he did, I caught his eye and he looked straight at me. And then he dove again. And this time I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast. And he came up and out of the water so that the next thing was to come crashing down on our small boat. And as his head rose up out of the water, I could see his eye right there. It was only a couple of feet from me. So close, I could see my reflection in that eye. And what I saw in that eye is what changed my life forever. I saw understanding. The whale understood what we were trying to do. Because I could see the effort he made to pull himself back, and he began to slide back into the sea. I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface, and he died. Could have killed us, and he chose not to do so. So I personally owe my life to that whale. But I also saw something else in that eye. Pity. Not for himself, but for us. That we could take life so thoughtlessly without any, you know, empathy at all. And as I sat there in this little rubber boat in the middle of the Soviet whaling fleet and the sun was going down, I said to myself, why are they killing these whales? They don't eat them. Sperm whales are killed for oil, spermaceti oil, which is highly prized for a high heat resistant lubricating oil. And one of the things that was mostly prized for in the Soviet Union was as a lubricating oil for the construction of intercontinental ballistic missiles. And I said, here we are, destroying these incredibly beautiful, self-aware, sentient creatures for the purpose of making a weapon meant for the mass extermination of human beings. And that's when it hit me. We're insane. We're certainly ecologically insane. And from that moment on, I said, look, I don't do this for people. I do it for them. And uh, I know 10 years later, I, um, you know, we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet in, uh, in uh, Reykjavik. And a former colleague from Greenpeace, he approached me, he said, you know what you did in Iceland was reprehensible, it's unforgivable, and you're an embarrassment for the whole movement. And I said, so? <laughs> and he says, aren't you concerned about what people think? I said, didn't sink those uh, whaling ships for you or for Greenpeace or for any human being. Sunk them for the whales. Find me a whale anywhere on the planet that disagreed with what we did, and I promise you, we won't do it again. But until then, we're going to continue to do it. Wow. So... You always, you never forgotten that whale that saved your life. That you looked him in the eye, huh? No, I saw so much in that eye that uh, it was really, it was a, certainly a life changing ex experience. And I've seen that intelligence in the eyes of whales and dolphins and elephants and so many other creatures around the world. It's there, or if we just choose to see it. Captain Paul Watson, the Canadian-American marine conservation activist who founded Sea Shepherd in 1977. His new book, co-authored with Tiffany Humphrey, is called Orchipedia, published by Groundswell Books. Info in the show notes. And for more on protesting SeaWorld and its enslavement of orcas, go to PETA.org. And now this. I've been vegetarian for decades, but vegan since 2003, and more seriously a vegan, meaning a no-oil vegan, since I became certified in whole food plant-based eating two years ago. I was introduced to the world of Dr. T. Colin Campbell, author of The China Study, which really opened my eyes to being a better vegan by eliminating oil. In the China Study cookbook written by Campbell's daughter, Leanne Campbell, there's a dietary nutrient composition chart from a European study that's been ongoing for more than 20 years. It shows that a meat-based diet compared to a vegetarian-based where eggs and dairy are consumed and a vegan diet which removes all animal products is not very different at all in terms of total fat or in terms of total sugars. And that removes any health advantage. What makes a difference? A whole food plant-based diet with no added fat and no added sugars. If you're not seeing the health advantage from your vegetarian or veganism that you expect, try cutting out the fats and sugars. Studies show it makes a difference. But remember, even if you're a regular vegan, you're still doing wonders for the animals. And that's my meal in a minute or so to help you be a better vegan on the PETA Podcast. Hey 
And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send the link of this show to your friends, you know, your really good friends and your friends who might might think about going to SeaWorld and they need some convincing. And this book, Orcopedia, it could do that. Uh, tell them you like the PETA podcast, of course, and, you know, contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on amok.com, or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at aldef.org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app. We're on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo. <laughs>